of the Watcher and Dahmer. Um, we are limited on time today, and so we are going to be trying to move a little bit quick through all of this so we can give you guys a little bit of your Saturday back, right? <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to do the Watcher first. We're going to take a 15-minute uh, intermission, and then we're going to come back and do Dahmer. So without further ado, do you? Deal. <laughs> Let me introduce you to Ryan Murphy. I was just saying out in the hallway how great and how weird it is to be in rooms with people again. I don't think I've done this in four years, so thank you all for coming. It's great to see you. It feels fun to be back in the world. Um, I'm trying to see where do I can I where do I where am I looking at everybody? Are they coming up on the screen? We're here. Okay, I'm waiting for them to come up. And there you are. Hi, everybody. It's the ladies of The Watcher. Um, so I'm going to start with Naomi Watts. Um, I've loved Naomi uh, for decades. And when I started to work on this with uh, Ian Brennan, Naomi was the first person I called. I didn't have a script. I had a story, it's based on a true story. And I said, are you interested in doing this? And you said, yes, quickly. And I was like, okay, great. And of course, now we're working, getting ready to work on another thing. And But Naomi, the interesting thing about this show is in two weeks, it's been, uh, it's had 300 million hours streamed, which is quite an incredible number. Um, and right when it first started to happen, you remarked to me about this is kind of the biggest hit for you since The Ring. Um, and that was another kind of horror thriller thing. Can you talk about that? And you love this genre. Talk about that, too. Yeah, I was so happy to be back in this genre. Um, I've had good success with it. And as an actor, there's a lot of emotions that come under the umbrella of fear. Um, so but I also really enjoy it as an audience member. Um, so I, yeah, when you called and knowing your body of work, um, it was a yes before you told me what the story was, just so you know. And it was a call I was hoping for for a long time. Um, and um, yeah, we were just saying before you got on the call, things, there have been big reactions for all of us and it feels very different to be in something that is actually being received so well, like across the board, like in major ways. And, uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's very often you put your work out there and, you know, people just don't get to see it. So it's, it's a nice feeling. Yeah, it's funny. I was talking to Richard Jenkins, who everybody's going to see in a little bit. He was on Dahmer. Um, and he was like, it, I've been in things where no one says anything. And as an artist, you sort of feel <laughs> terrible. So it's interesting to be a part of something that has become part of the culture in, a, in an interesting way. Um, Jennifer Coolidge, who's having quite a moment right now, the iconic Jennifer Coolidge, who I've loved for a long time. Jennifer was in one of my first shows, Nip Tuck. I wrote this big arc for her. Um, <laughs> How, how does it feel, Jennifer? You just won an Emmy. Um, wh what are you going through in your life? And how do you feel uh, like you have two hits in a row, soon to be three with White Lotus 2 coming on? How does that feel for you? You're, the people are saying we're in the, what is it, the Coolidge Renaissance or something, as if you ever went away. But can you talk about that feeling that you're having? Well, I felt like I went away. But uh, thanks, Ryan. But no, yeah, I, it felt like it. I don't know. You know what I mean? This is. Um, um, I was trying to make sense of it. You know, I'm trying to make sense of how. I don't know if it's you know sheer luck. Um. I don't know. I'm. I'm just thrilled. You know. Um. Maybe it's you know just not having it together. You know because people are streaming and maybe the streaming audience is uh, maybe like someone who doesn't have it together more than uh, the other crowd, you know, the other sort of, you know, you know what I mean? So I, that, that's all I could think of was like that, you know what I mean? It's sort of a less, you know, maybe they're less, you know, you could, it's all about being less perfect and not, you know, 
you know, I've been around for a long time, but somehow, um, you know, I got some great parts thanks to you and, and Mike White. And boy, does that make a difference as to how the day, the week, the year goes, you know, like when you what get these my great most parts. moments was when I called Jennifer and I said, I have this part of this insane real estate agent based on a Reddit thread and the character's name is Karen Calhoun. And you said, I'll do it if I get to kill someone. <laughs> you were very interested in the idea that I find fascinating of playing a darker, ruthless character that you said nobody in a million years has thought to write for you. And I'm like, I want you to play something like that. Someone who is <laughs> villainous. I think you could say Karen is villainous. Can you talk about that? Why were you so interested in that? Well, you know, it's such a, what and what? Um, no, you know, I think. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Are you? Um, no, you know, I think you know. If you look at you know what the roles that I've been getting, you know, I've, I've been very lucky and gotten some great jobs and Stifler's mom and you know uh, Paulette and Legally Blonde and stuff. But you know, um, no one really thinks of me when it comes to uh, you know maybe a dark evil person or <laughs> um, someone who's who's not someone who's not really very nice I, you know what I mean so I, I've always I had a fantasy about it and um and you know I think I told told you or I've told other people this you know when you were making American Horror Story and you were renting they were using my house for it I was just praying you would be like Jennifer and I mean, I never bumped into you, but you, I just thought you were using the house. I would have to bump into you. And I thought you'd go like, Jennifer, I have a horrible part for you where you're someone really rotten. <laughs> but it didn't happen until 10 years later. Yeah. I, 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 I'm thrilled. I was shocked. Of course, I would have cast you immediately. Um, Margo, what's interesting to me is you, your character seems to be the Halloween outfit of the, of the season. Um, all of you, interestingly enough, I've been sent, I, I don't really read social media, but I have people who do it, but I'm constantly, Noma, like also you with the turban and the gloves and, and Naomi and the creams, everybody wants those clothes and Jennifer and Karen Chanel knockoffs. You guys are all kind of hitting the zeitgeist in a really cool way. But I guess for Margo, my question is more serious. One of the things that I was the most thrilled about was to do a show like this and all of the women's roles, except for one, were women over 40. And I know that you guys got to shoot a lot of um, scenes together, you know, and be, we've, we've all become close and love Mia Farrow so much. Can you talk about what that's like to work with this company of women? Uh, I just thought that being with this company uh, was uh, one of the thrills of my life, being in a room with uh, with uh, Jennifer and, and Naomi, I, and I remember a, a, a whole day of, of, of working and saying, we, we all said, this is the most fun we've ever had. And, they, and no, Noma, I, I didn't get to do anything with you, which pisses me off. Uh, thank you, Ryan. And, uh, <laughs> but, you know, women uh, of, of certain age um, only get better, juicier, more wonderful, and uh, have capabilities beyond what people realize. And I appreciate that you embrace that and that other people have embraced that. And, uh, you know, I'm 71 and kicking and going strong. So, yay, Margo. Hey. I mean, what, what, let me ask you this, because you've had such a long career. What have you always wanted to play that you haven't played? Yeah. Well, I do want to do a musical. Well, you came to the right person for that, Margo. Uh, not many songs, maybe two. <laughs> You'd be good. You'd be really good. Um, Noma, I loved you also for a very long time, and Noma, um, as a favor to me, did a, a really brilliant guest star on Pose. 
she played Electra's mother and she was amazing. And that's how we kind of got into each other's lives. And I, um, Ian and I also wrote this role for her. Um, and the interesting thing for me in doing this show was what I loved about this show was kind of the not knowing. I feel like that we're all living in this anxious age and everybody sort of has the way that you calm your brain is to get the answers to things. And this piece is unsolved and it's about not knowing. And I wanted to ask you, Noma, who do you think is the watcher? Can I swear? Yes. God knows. You don't know. Who do you think? Because I, I want... love the possibilities in our show. Yeah. I don't know because I love the possibilities. I can't help you there, Ryan. Good luck, mate. Mm. Well, what I what I loved about I'll go back to that, but also what I loved about working with you is I said, you know what? What I love about your character is this sort of um, murder she wrote quality to it someone who um makes a living solving riddles in real life can you talk and has fun and has fun doing it but can i also add for everyone's knowledge what i love people keep asking about the gloves and the gloves right from the beginning were ryan's notion that she had to wear gloves the adora had to wear gloves and uh, I know we didn't have it, but there's a lovely storyline behind the gloves, which I absolutely adored when we played with Naomi in the restaurant. Um, but, oh my God, sorry, I just jumped into your question. Were you asking a question? I can't remember. Like, 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 I'm happy to talk about gloves. No, um, what, what, one of the things that was interesting about this, I don't even know that we talked about it, was because, you know, this was a, based on a true story. It, um, it happened. It also was one of those things where when we got the rights, we were trying to be respectful to the family. They had certain caveats about their children, which we were on board with. And when we were filming it and making it, all of you are actually based on either real people or people on our research. You know, we fell into Reddit wormholes. Um, and we, we there's actually was a theory, I don't know if Jennifer knows this, about a real estate agent was in on it. There was another theory about a screenwriter teacher in town. Um, Naomi, why do you think that people right now love this true crime whodunit kind of genre? What is it, what's going on in the world that makes us love these type of stories? Gosh, that's such a big question. And um, it's so clear there is an appetite for it right now. Um, I don't know, there's a lot of darkness in the world and a lot of chaos and somehow you know, working these things out in our brain, maybe, you know, like trying to read what each person is thinking and what, how are they wired? What is it that makes them that dark person and drive them towards doing these terrible things? Um, so I don't know, maybe it's a, a way to try and understand what's going on and unpack or things. Like, is there a sense of needing control by, figuring things out. I, I don't know. It's it's a big question, but it's definitely happening. And everyone seems to be obsessed with with these darker um, mysteries and psychological thrillers right now. Yeah, it definitely is a moment in the culture where people are, I think, really looking like you said to put their anxieties somewhere like I, I, I feel that. I don't understand things. Yeah. Um, if there was a watcher season two, what would you guys want to do in that show? Obviously, Noma would come back and haunt everyone, but but what would what do you do? You have any ideas for that? Have you thought about that? It's something that I get asked about a lot lately, and I thought I'd turn it to you guys, Jennifer. What do you want Karen to do, and if she comes back? Uh, well, I think Karen needs a good slap across the face, and maybe um, um I think I think. Karen needs to be punished. You do? I think Warren. No, I don't. I, I think Karen's gotten away with a lot. What? And what? I, I, Nora's going to take care of Karen. Yeah, you guys. Okay. Right. One of the fun things about shooting a show like this, I spoke about it earlier, was, and Jennifer, you can speak about this, was, you know, you and Mia Farrow have become very close friends in real life. Can you talk about Mia, Jennifer, and your friendship with her? Because I loved 
you know, you didn't really have that many scenes together, but you guys have become real buddies to the point that I joke I want to write a, another show about you guys as private detectives. But um, remember the Snoop Sisters? There was a show like that when I was a kid. But can you talk just about Mia and, and your friendship with her? We love her, but I wanted you to talk about her. Yeah, you know, she uh, she and I it was a we were it was we were shooting a scene uh, one day uh, when there was very very big snowstorm came in and we were just sitting there in our chairs uh, um, on set and we got into these very elaborate conversations and I I just immediately found I thought we found the same things funny I mean we, we were just laughing the whole time and um you know she's just so smart her take on things is so I mean you know she's that's with uh it has sight on so many topics um and yeah, and then she made me laugh. And then, you know, she stays up late and I stay up late. You know, a lot of people go to bed early. And um, so we would talk at night and, um, uh, you know, we had that in common too. We would discuss all this stuff. And um, I just find hers to be so amusing and riveting, you know, but I have to say the girls on this show, Ryan, you really have impeccable taste and in personality and, and just and talent and, these women, I mean, I would go anywhere in the world with these women. Yeah, I agree. Like, what I, I love even look, looking at this screen with the four of you together. I know when I started out in the business 20 years ago, you know, you would not have a show that was this popular with, you know, actresses over 40. People said, well, nobody wants to watch that. And when I started to get any popularity, it was like, no, they really do. The interesting thing about this show was I went to all of my first choices and you all said yes. There was really no casting involved except me calling up people. You know, I think that Naomi was the only one that I hadn't worked with thus far. Margo and I had just done impeachment together. Um, but. How do you feel? I mean, I feel like there is a new tide coming where there, there's room, maybe it's because of streamers, where there's room for actresses to be over 35 and have many more opportunities. I feel like that's happening in the past five years. Do you all feel that way? Can you talk about that? Noma? I, I absolutely do. I, I, it was such a thrill to find out who the rest of the cast were going to be. And absolutely post 50 year old um, in awe of the experiences of all these women, um, Mia included, absolutely. And, uh, and the company and Lou, your costume designer. So you making this is wonderful, but we need the writers. It's all about the writers. It's all about the stories and access to those stories. That's why we are here to serve because there are some great stories not just the linear ones that we've known so this to be part of this for me is extraordinary hmm. how about margo how do you what are you what are you feeling about the business right now oh well you know i everybody said uh, you know to me i mean i never thought that uh, you couldn't be older and work i mean i i worked always i know that a lot of people didn't know it but i was working always since uh, I was in my 20s and, uh, you know, I would just find the work wherever it was. And and then I got and then I got justified and I won an Emmy at 60. And then my world opened up again, once again, bigger, bigger, bigger. And uh, and here I am now, 11 years later. And uh, this is the, this has more uh, the, the, the street walking from 80th Street to 72nd Street in New for me two days ago was almost like suffocating because of the crowds of people that were gathering as I walked down the street with because of the watcher. Mo! Wow. You say, Mo! You know, and, uh, turn around! Uh, uh, can I get a picture? And it was like, but it was, it was bigger and more, more insane than anything I've experienced. Naomi, you, you and I have had those conversations where you talk about you were told that at 40 something would happen to you and you were like, you know what? No, that's not how it's going to be. Can you talk about that? Because you've been in the business for so long. What did people tell you about turning a certain age and then how is it? What has your reality been? 
Yeah, so I didn't get any real recognition, even though I'd been in the business from way before um, Mulholland Drive, but that really launched me into a new um, arena. Um, and I was already 30, 31 maybe. And so, you know, people were saying, you've got to get going. You've got to do a lot because it's going to, you know, all be over by the time you're 40. You know, there aren't any roles after 40 kind of thing. And, and I said, well, why? What do you mean? We're half the population. We've got stories to tell after 40. What, what do you mean? And this person was like, oh, well, you know, it's sort of like, you know, once you become unfuckable, then, you know, there's no more stories to tell. You're done. And I was like, what? <laughs> what why, why do you become unfuckable? Oh, oh, because your reproductive organs are no longer doing what they're supposed to do. And then, you know, like, the, the, the roles just dry up and you're, sp you're supposed to play the crazy lady, you know, in the background somewhere. Um, well, I, I think that things have changed immensely. I mean, here we all are, I mean, well, I should speak for myself, over 50 um, and, and going strong. And we're telling, you know, as, as far as I'm concerned, the longer the life, the juicier it gets, the more wisdom, the more collective experiences, therefore the, the greater stories to tell. And, and again, I just want to reiterate what everyone said. You're someone who's out there creating those opportunities, um, which not only is great for us as actors, because we love to work, but you know, it's great for the audiences to know and understand and empathize with women with rich, important stories. And so I feel incredibly grateful. Well, I, I give credit to that to my grandmother because she kind of raised me and took me to movies, a lot of them. So I kind of grew up with that very strong female lead. That's what she wanted to see. And I always say to people, you know, you will tell that if I've been captured by aliens, if the lead in one of my shows is a 20 year old girl, that's, <laughs> that's when you know I'm not me anymore because it, I think it does matter. And I've had so many moments with women. I remember I had a moment with Kathy Bates um, before we did American Horror Story together where she came into my office and she has so much to give and is one of the greatest of all time and talked about how she could not get a job that nobody was writing for her. So that's when something clicked. And of course, then that show became hugely popular with her in it. And I do think that, that it works and I'm thrilled to continue to, to write roles like that and to work with all of you again, you know, once you get into my world, um, you stay in it. And I think you're all so phenomenal on the show. And it was a very fun, wonderful experience making it with you. And you're, you're, I've idolized all of you in different ways for a long time. So thank you for doing it. Thank you. And I'm, and I'm thrilled that people are watching it all over the world. Like it's, it, to me, it was always a really fun, delicious popcorn kind of story. And it's stuff that I, I miss seeing. So I'm, I'm glad that we got to make it. I think we have, do we have questions? A, a list of questions where I can't see anything. There's anybody. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Jennifer, where are you? Are you in your New Orleans house? Yeah, I am. It looks very Halloween and you throw a huge Halloween party every year, right? Yes, I do. I mean, you know, I have, it's it's barely what it was. I mean, you have you can't really have many people during these. You know, it's still sort of COVID time, so you can't really have a big blockbuster. But um, can you imagine being a trick or treater and ringing a doorbell and there's Jennifer Coolidge? <laughs> <laughs> do you do that? Do you let the trick or treaters come up? No. Um. Knowing you, you probably do. No, I, no, I, I have trick or treaters. I do. Yeah, I do. I do have trick or treaters. All right, questions. Yes, our first question is from Dented Davidson from Gold Derby. This one's for Ryan and Jennifer. Jennifer brings so much humor to her role, but I'm not sure if every actress would have interpreted it the same way. So my question is, did you write Karen to bring that humor to the story or did Jennifer Coolidge naturally bring it when she was cast? Well, I will answer that. And yeah, because I've worked with Jennifer before and, and loved her as a friend for so many years. And the thing about Jennifer is there's no one in the world like Jennifer. And Jennifer has a very singular, wonderful talent. Um, and, you know, when Jennifer 
is in a scene and is, you know, my feeling was say what's written, but just make up whatever you want to say. You're Jennifer Coolidge. And one of the first things we, we shot was a scene with Jennifer and Naomi in the country club. And I don't know how many takes we did because Jennifer just goes off in these sort of stream of consciousness, brilliant improvisational takes. And I hope that you, Jennifer, felt safe working in my company because I would always just say, if I wasn't directing and I directed two of them, I would say, just let Jennifer say whatever she wants. And it's always gold. And, and Naomi and I got in that spirit. But I personally love that. I think you cast somebody for what they can do and bring to the table. And Jennifer is one of the great, greatest comedians of all time. But how do you feel about that, Jennifer? I bet do you like do you like constriction or do you like freedom? Well, you know, um, uh, no, I like the freedom until someone doesn't like it. And then, um, and then I <laughs> turn off the, you know, sometimes you know, people are like, do that. And then they're like, you know what, don't do that. You yeah. know, so, but I like that you were, you were very cool about it. And um, so I thank you that for that. But, you know, I sort of thought, you know, Ryan didn't tell us if we were the watcher, we didn't know and everything. And so I thought, um, I wanted to play it where I was, uh, you know, I was trying to throw, I, I felt like we were trying to throw people off and I wanted to, um, I wanted to make some moments funny because, um, I thought maybe it would be more surprising that I would be the watcher. Yeah, and sometimes I but, um, tell people you're the watcher. You know, so I, I was coming from that angle too. I wanted to be, um, less suspicious. Yeah. I, my feeling just to sum up working with Jennifer is, you know, Jennifer is like, a jazz musician and you don't tell a jazz musician to play sheet music you ask them to interpret it and kind of go off and what happens and naomi you can talk about this all of us can but when you're working with someone like jennifer you start and then she goes off and it's almost a miracle when she somehow in character comes back to the point and continues on and I don't know. I love working that way. I, I found it to be completely inspiring. And there were takes where Jennifer would riff for seven minutes and would get ovations from the crew. Like, that's just, you know, that's why I'm so happy that, you know, that you're having this moment, like that people are appreciating you and seeing you for everything you have always been. But I, I, I'm on president of the Jennifer Coolidge fan club. That's all I have to say. Naomi, what was it like for you in those scenes? Or Margo, anybody? No, I'm just saying I'm a, I'm a, I'm in that fan club too. Yeah. As am I. Sorry for but that. Doing a, doing a scene with Jennifer, you might as well, you know, just leave. <laughs> Nobody's going to see you, let me just say. <laughs> but if you look at those takes, it's really subtle, the work that everybody does. But there's some of those takes at the country club where you're like, Jennifer is giving you murderous realtor, like she's she's playing something fascinatingly dark, and I, I love those scenes. Yeah. Next question from Lilu from Hong Kong News. This is for everyone. Having done this series, do you think this experience will stay with you in regards of thinking about the past homeowners? Past homeowners. Yeah, I, I, for me, it does. I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to make the show is when I read that article, I was like, that is my worst fear, that someone would write and say something about my children, and that has happened to me. So I deeply relate to safety and the way the world is, and I think we've been in a very dark place, as you know, Naomi said, and I think that the show is about all of us have this instinct in this world of darkness that we're in to protect our families whatever that means to you. And this is a show universally about, I want to protect my loved ones from harm and what happens if I feel I cannot do that. That's what, to me, that was the reason I wanted to make this. I mean, Naomi, did you feel that way? I think we talked about that in the beginning. Yeah, I think, I think what was so compelling about the story is that you could imagine yourself in the same situation. And, and I felt like it was, something everyone could imagine because of, like you just said, we sent a simple theme right at the core, which is we're safe in our homes with our family, right? Until you're not. Um, and that is a threatening 
um, thought to entertain. If, and, and so you relate to that couple, that family, and um, yeah. I also thought it was one of the, an opportunity, when I was a kid, one of my favorite movies was the Amityville Horror. And it was an iconic house, and I'll never forget, you know, the poster of that. The house was a character. And this was a very different circumstances, but to me, I always felt like this was a real estate thriller. This idea that you, you're you moving away from what you perceive to be the city or crime or conflict, and you think you're safe, but the way the world is now, you're really not safe from anything, be it COVID, be it many, many, many different things. It was a sort of a, a very rich world to write about terror and the current experience, I think, culturally. This question is for the ladies. What was it about this project that made you sign on? Me. Just yes. Not at all. It's true. Metaphorically. That's my answer. Right that's there. My, that's my answer. I'm saying for real. No, really. I mean, uh, you said that uh, you, you could come and do this. Great. It's going to be a fun part, and you're going to get to be glamorous. Now, what do you yes. think that I... I'm wearing a tracksuit for the entire show. <laughs> but uh, very glamorous, Margot. You rock a tracksuit. I think you look great. You know, Margot was like, "This is your fucking definition of glamour." <laughs> a tracksuit with Richard Kind in a matching tracksuit. Yeah. No I'm kidding. <laughs> right. But it was, it was you for me. I, it was before I read the material or the story. So yeah, you have to own that, Ryan. We're yeah, here for you. Yeah, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, <that's> your fault. <laughs> for Naomi, what was the filming experience given the tone of the series? Um, I mean, you can see a glimpse of it just here in this, in this moment now where we had a lot of fun and um, you know, it was five months of shooting. Most of us are local New Yorkers and or have known the city um, well and lived here before. So um, we just, yeah, it was such a great expansive cast and people that we knew and respected their body of work coming in. And there wasn't a bad seed among us. We just all got on so well and the material you know, it's not scary when you're making this material for, for me. I, I mean, unless you're doing like a really long shot, that's the only time I'll get scared or freaked out. Um, but, you know, so much of what's scary happens in post. And um, and so, you know, we're shooting out of sequence and everything. So, um, yeah, we, we had plenty of time to bond and chat and theorize about who the watcher was and, you know, that was always shifting um, depending on the scenes. Um, but yeah, I would say it was one of the great experiences of my career. This is from Stacey Yvonne from Out.com. Ryan, what was it about this story that interested you and how did you hear about it? I heard about it when I read the article and um, I was like, oh, I really want to do this. And then I found out that Netflix had the rights and I had just done a deal with Netflix. So I said, oh, this is great. And then my friend Eric Newman, who's the producer on this, had the rights. And I said, I really, um, do you have a writer? And he said, no. And I said, well, let Ian and I write it because I love this and I, I relate to it. I, I spoke about this a minute ago, but that idea of nobody feels safe ever anymore and how that feeling of, is this feeling going to pass or is this the way it's always going to be now is something I was really feeling in my own life. And I wanted to write about that. And I wanted to write about families and security. And the other thing that I liked about it is like, look at these actors. To me, these iconic actors in a piece like this, it, I also have always wanted to do sort of like um, an Agatha Christie sort of tale. I really grew up loving um, like when I was a, a kid, Death on the Nile, you know, like just this all-star cast with these amazing actresses specifically. So all of these things sort of piqued my interest at once. And I think that this happened really quickly from the moment I started writing it to the moment where I called Naomi. It was, it didn't take a long time. Like Dahmer took 10 years, this took 18 months. So it was a very compressed um, thing to make. And also it was just 
fun to me. It was, it was sort of, there's no real violence in it. There's nothing really heavy in it. It's a whodunit. And I really wanted to just explore that idea, you know, in my work. Hey, thank you so much. Anything else? Are we done? Are we good? My grandmother is no longer with us, but her name is Myrtle Anderson, S-E-N. Um, and I grew up in Indiana and she, um, actually this moment in time that this fall that I'm having with, with Dahmer and American Horror Story and The Watcher, like I feel her with me every moment of the day because she, when I was four years old, forced me to watch Dark Shadows, literally like forced me. And I was <laughs> afraid and she was like, don't be a sucker. She was a tough lady. And then she would give me candy if I would not hide behind her armchair. Like, it was our game. So I grew up, and then she saw that I was kind of interested in that genre. And then she took me to, we would drive for hours, it was Indianapolis, to revival houses. She took me to um, her favorite movie, which was Dracula with Bella Lugosi. Um, she hated that I loved Barbara Streisand, my grandmother. She wanted me to be in the dark arts. Um, so this, everything that I'm doing, I feel, I feel her and, and I asked her at one point, why do you like these movies? And she said, because the horror genre, thriller genre. And she said to me, because they make you feel alive, don't they? You feel something. And that has always, always stayed with me. But that, thank you for bringing her up. I might cry talking about her, but she was oh. truly, other than my children, the big love of my life. Oh. Thank you. Thanks, ladies. Thank you. Love you guys. Talk soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Ryan. Bye, ladies. Bye. Bye, Bye. 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 Thank you, guys. Bye.